been very patient, Swati, listening to everything for the past two days. For a, uh, yeah, you know, it's a pretty strange situation. The entire industry is in. They've invested in 4G, and we are talking about 5G. They still haven't recovered eight eight hundred thousand crore in debt. That's a lot of money. So, and you know, auctions expected towards next 2019. How is this all going to happen, and how are we going to really? unlock the true potential that we have out of this. First, 4G has not been exploited fully. I hand it over to you now, each of you all. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think the first uh, order of business for operators today is to make sure that the 4G network operates as advertised, right? And I think one of the critical bottlenecks that we face, as uh, ZTE gentleman just pointed out, is that the difficulty of laying fiber, as I said last uh, yesterday, at nine gigabits worth of consumption per user, our networks are choking. And uh, the point that we have to ask from a network operator perspective, when you had an all data, all voice network, we knew that the maximum anybody would use per user is about 500 minutes. The problem with a all data network, you can never predict what a peak load on the network is because if something goes viral, if somebody starts uh, downloading a big file with somebody sent, high pixel definition photograph, the usage can spike at any particular point, degrading the system for just about everybody. So those dynamics are changing and operators are learning to live in this new environment. Now, let me give you one of the fundamental challenges that operators face vis-a-vis -vis what we call OTT providers, video providers who are riding on our networks. What happens is that uh, increasingly, the quantum of information encapsulated by any person, be it TV because you're going to high definition, uh, you know, you embed uh, advertising and everything else, uh, the load factor on the networks from the OTT folks increases, all right? And it has been increasing. And you had 10.3 million concurrent streams running on Star Sports during the, uh, I think it was the IPL finals. Correct. I mean, that's, a, that's something which when I speak to OTT providers world over, they find it astonishing that the networks could manage it. Latency was absolutely not there. And, and, and that, that was miraculous. I mean, a lot of credit goes to Akamai, the Hotstar team in house. So. But, but, but let's take that to the next step in terms of saying uh, the profitability factor, right? Because that's what I need to get investments into the network. Now, what I see is that because of the increasing load factor in terms of what is in these packets, I have to meet QoS standards, all right? The try will penalize me if I don't meet the quality of standard. So the more information you pump because you want to provide more content, I am forced to make the investments in the network to meet QoS standards, right? Now, in terms of my revenue model, I can't enter into what we call two-sided deals. I cannot get into an advertising revenue backend, so therefore I have to rely on subscription revenue, which because of the competitive nature of the marketplace is very slim and thin, all right? So here's the conundrum. Increasing load, all right, on my network, QoS, positive of investment, guess what happens? Network quality continues to deteriorate. Yeah, but you know, if you look at it, the, I'll come to you later on because, yeah. If you look at it, the telcos are partnering more and more. Vodafone, uh, you know, if you're a Vodafone Red customer, you get free subscriptions. Airtel gives free subscriptions to OTT providers. Uh, you know, and they themselves are setting up their own uh, offerings like Airtel as Airtel TV, whether it's doing linear streaming as well as, so I mean, if that is the problem, then why are they driving into this entire thing without having their back end in place? So one thing is that you have to keep up with customer demand, right? So this is being driven. No operator is going to make any type of an investment or an offering if it does not resonate with the customer, right? So, yeah, but the experience is not that good. So, you know, you let's just take the case, right? Uh, 15 years ago, right, all of us uh, wanted these big speakers in our homes, right, to enjoy audio <laughs> component. My daughter, you know, who's in this younger generation, all she needs is two earbuds and a small little Absolutely, device, right? Yeah. And she's happy with uh, the quality of the service. 
our new generation is happy to consume TV and content on a small screen that they have in their hand, right? So the whole expectation in terms of the experience has changed dramatically as far as the newer generation, it's, uh, you know, the older generation sometimes that continues to want 15-inch diagonal screens and yeah. all of this, all right? So I think going to this, so when you look at this consumption factor increasingly, the expectation level of the consumers have also changed, yes. So the question is, I'm in a public service. I don't have the option of saying, is that, you know, just because I've run out of capacity, all right, I'm going to stop selling tickets. Yeah, but if, if you listen to Maibao's presentation, he said quality of video is m very important. That's what studies have shown. So quality of video is one amongst the preferred choices for customers. So the question is, what is the lowest common denominator that everybody gets to, right? If the competition does not provide meaningful differentiation in terms of the user experience, that you're absolutely right. So I think that's where operators are entering into partnering relationships. The point that you ask, why is a geo interested in acquiring a Den or a Hathaway sure. or other operators? It's simply the pipe. Absolutely. I don't I think that. they're too interested in the content side because they can make the deals with the content provider. It's simply access into the household because what is coming, you can go to the Reliance Geo Experience Center in Mumbai and see what their smart home looks like. I've seen it. I've been right? there. Yeah. You see that. So Absolutely. in order to carry that type of traffic. You do need right, lots of bandwidth. You yeah. are requiring pretty broad pipes, preferably uh, fiber, you know, which is where Rati comes into the picture. But when you get there, right, saying that, uh, you know, and knowing the difficulty, if I can get existing access, my gosh, you know, on a cost basis, it's cheaper to buy than to build. Absolutely not. That's good news for her, yes. the requirement for fiber. I mean, you guys have been expanding capacity like there's no tomorrow. So, uh, and, and, and you've got an order book which is filled up. You've got BharatNet and you've got, I think, the Indian, uh, Indian cities, smart cities, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, in terms of how you're predicting demand and how, how do you go about not having overbuild happening? Uh, overbuild happening, yeah. yeah. Well, so, see, I'll tell you what. I mean, uh, let me not answer this specific question, but, you know, shift it a little and just take from what he said. See, the, the fact remains is it's as simple as uh, uh, there are only two things that are important, speed and access. And, and I think somewhere down the line when we are in, in, in a lot of the industry engagements, we get so anal onto the nuances of the industry that we don't realize that at, at, at its simplicity, it really comes down to something like this. And, um, and, 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 and disruption will happen only in these two areas. If you are able to give high quality access and if you're able to give reliable speed, the co consumer is anyway addicted. Yeah. And, and therefore, uh, uh, an infrastructure. And I thought of this a lot when I was listening to uh, everyone. Uh, I wonder why the infrastructure is not used as an advertising or a marketing point uh, when you're engaging with consumers. We've always used content as, as king, and it, it rightly should be. But when it comes to infrastructure, that is one area that, that can actually give you the edge uh, over the other, I mean, put it out in the open, and our network is of X quality, and we, 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 we can deliver ABC because of its technicalities. The white goods industry does it very well, sure. right? Uh, or the mobile phone industry. So, so I feel that that's where fiber comes into play uh, in a big way. Uh, fiber demonstrates the uh, uh, both access and speed. I mean, access if you, you know if the fiber reaches you, and definitely the speed. So in, in, the, in the year of the video, in the era of the video, uh, in the era of uh, gaming and so much more, I mean, actually, there is a choice for the businesses to, to disrupt because they have the potential to do that. And there is a choice for the uh, consumer to, uh, to uh, you know, consume more than what they have been doing till now. And keeping these two things in mind, I feel the push for... Uh, you, broadcasters should ask, I mean, you know, Mr. Distributor, what's the quality of your fiber or your network? And, and that's where the negotiation can really take place. Yeah, that's true. Including, I mean, just to, sorry, just to add, in, in the airlines industry, you would like to go for a 787 versus an old plane sure. or an A380. I mean, I think the conversation will eventually move towards what's the quality, finally, of the network. That, that gives me the comfort that 
if I am going for this particular uh, operator or this particular distributor, I know I'm not going to be left high and dry when, uh, you know, India is playing Pakistan in some godforsaken place, you know, so. Yeah. You, you offered solutions to Reliance Geo through FTTX mantra, the mantra thing, which is a quick yes. setup solution. Yeah. So do you have solutions? I mean, though, Reliance Geo is a high capex kind of an investment. Yeah. For, let's say, people with 500,000 connections and cable, it could be a cooperative out of Kerala who could then use your product to actually offer an FTT head solution. Do you have solutions like that? Because you also have a bill, you offer the entire solution, right? Yeah, so see, by the end of the day, uh, uh, fiber can be sliced and diced in many sure. ways. So we do have solutions for the MVNOs, the MSOs, we have solutions for uh, all licensees, uh, if you look at. And, um, um, and that answers your question that yes, we do have solutions. It really uh, depends on, by the end of the day, the quality of the fiber, the amount of count that is uh, required. I understand, yeah. yeah so, um, uh, but, but I feel the, uh, the concentration should be in the architecture of the way the fiber is laid. Sure. Um, uh, if a fiber is cut, what happens? Then, yep. then you're, you know, you're pretty much done with, right? So creating redundancy by running rings around the fiber when you're laying the fiber uh, is, is very critical so that you can de-risk the whole thing. And that's one of the areas that Rajan and I and so many people in the industry are fighting for in terms of how do we create ease of business in this area, uh, so to say. No, so, but have you managed to supply quite a bit of fiber yes, to the yes, cable industry? Absolutely, we are I mean, to which of the major operators would you be doing, apart from Geo? We are supplying to pretty much everyone. Right, from Hathaway. And, and they are listening to you to actually ring fence and have extra capacity so that there's, somebody's cutting, they don't have to go rush with a splicing machine to, to stitch it up. So it's far more complex than that. I mean, it's, it's the quality of the fiber that matters. It is the way, that, you know, there, there, there are fibers that are impact proof. Recently when there was, I think, the floods, right, in, yeah. in Chennai and there was some storm somewhere else and all. So uh, the, the, your, your infrastructure is the one that gets most impacted. So at that point in time, and I won't name our customers, but one or two of our customers, their fiber held very strong uh, because they, they went for a certain impact proof, intrusion proof kind of. And rats are a major problem in yeah, India. Yeah. So, so that's where, in fact, policy is playing a big role in ensuring that there should ideally be in the future common ducting and ways to ensure that uh, weather conditions and things like rodents and otherwise can, can you know, uh, problems can get solved. But the fiber industry in itself is utilizing technology to ensure that it is rodent rat proof or, or, or in many ways it could be earthquake proof or, sure. or terror proof. And we, we are doing, we are, we are putting out networks in Jammu and Kashmir for the defense. Great. We definitely do not want that network to go down. So one thing is there that, you know, when you work with the defense, we, we, we have to de-risk in a big way. Absolutely. And therefore, because of that, we are building solutions even for uh, the, 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 our smallest of customers. Um, uh, and it's all very, very customized and packaged accordingly. Great. Now, coming back to the 5G, are you preparing for the demand which will come for the backhaul side and stuff like that? Are you, is that why you expanded capacity? Or you've got board approval recently? I'm very glad you've done all that. And, and about that. That's brilliant, yes. Uh, we are uh, building capacity, uh, you know, keeping in mind 5G. A lot of our R&D goes into uh, preparing for the 5G uh, revolution. And, you know, we are into 100 countries. So when we think about 5G, we're not thinking about only India. But because we are in India, we also get the advantage of looking at everyday challenges. And therefore, the way we handle 5G solutions is different. A case in point. Now, when you're laying fiber in India, your fiber cable is, you know, the ducting is very narrow. I agree. Right? So we have recently, uh, which is the FTTH um, uh, mantra, FTTX mantra, we recently launched a 800 plus fiber count in a cable which is worth just 42, 44 fibers. Wow. Right? So that means that made we, uh, in, in the era of 5G and IoT, where you need uh, fiber to be connected to multiple machines, to um, uh, multiple services. Uh, 800, we have 1,100 count. So we are, we are creating fiber to the 
uh, you know, the environment and the terrains of, of, the, of, of the place that we're living in. One more thing about 5G related. The fiber that we are also creating is bend insensitive. I mean, look at Bombay or look at Bangalore or look at metros. You cannot, we don't have the land to roll out fiber uh, uh, straight. It, it needs to almost climb various areas in buildings, right? So in such an environment, we want to ensure that the quality uh, of the data flow does not uh, reduce. So we have, we, we, are, we are ensuring that the fiber that we are creating is bend insensitive, it's high uh, quality in the, in the fiber itself, and then we are ensuring the cabling is such that it can be easily, um, you know, identified when, you, when your GIS system doesn't work. Sure. I'll just give me an example. Or the fact that it has enough to um, uh, sustain multiple uh, machines attached to it. I understand. So now... And uh, we're into smart cities. So absolutely. I mean, but, but smart cities is a while away, like we said yesterday. So, uh, you know, the roadmap has been laid out, but there seems to be some hesitation from the government in terms of, they said 2019. Will that happen or will that not happen when standards are just about falling in place for as far as 5G is concerned? Uh, so are we going to see that happening in time? Uh, so, uh, Anil, first of all, let's ask ourselves, what is this 5G all about and do we know it? And when do we need it? So I think this is the question that happens, right? So I think the first thing that we have to ask ourselves, one, does the customer care between 3G, 2G, 4G, it doesn't care about it. So the download speed. Yeah, he, yeah. So, th th so it's the customer experience that ultimately matters, right? The alphabet soup is not a material concern to the person, him or her. So now ask ourselves, what does 5G promise? 5G promises higher speeds, lower latency, higher densification, higher reliability, all right? Uh, and why are all of these important? Because we're saying is that as we move into the internet of things, machine to machine and uh, cloud computing, we're going to see one thing is den what we call densification of our networks, which the 4G present networks will not be able to sustain. So let me give you an example. What we see today, when there's a cricket match in Brabant Stadium or whatever, the stadium in Mumbai, all right, and you have uh, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 30,000 people sitting there, surprisingly now, not only are they watching the cricket match, they're also watching it in real time because you're up in the nosebleed section, right? So. In, at that particular point, it's going to be very, very difficult to dynamically increase bandwidth based on this. So this is where 5G will come in. So 5G will be a local application, will not be what we call a wall-to-wall -wall carpeted across the board thing. So it'll come up in sections. Why? Because as I said, high densification. Now let's look at an application, agriculture, which is a matter of high importance in India, right? You've got a one acre field, today the guy gets up, he's got to go put on the pump, watch about electricity, water consumption, fertilization, when, how. Today, what I can do is that I can put in a thousand little probes in the ground, I can find out what the humidity is, I can find out when he needs the fertilizer, or to which plant he needs the particular fertilizer, what the, you know, de you know, the water content, and if I need to spray, I can send a drone, all right? <laughs> so, given that, that's a situation where it's high densification. I've got a thousand probes that are all transmitting, right? And that has to happen, so again, 5G will come in. Now, again, another situation in India when we're talking about the imbalance between our medical system where every doctor is in the urban area and the poor rural folks who the majority of the population lives does not have the service, so you're going to have to go in there and provide medical services. Now, when you have a medical interaction, you need high reliability in the middle of a medical interaction. You don't want your networks to go down. You want low latency because when the guy is sitting at the other end, you know, working in his little joystick, you know, the other arm at the other end that's doing it has to have very low latency. So today in our networks, 4G, it's 12 milliseconds or more. You're going to get down to two milliseconds, right? Our speeds are at about 10 Mbps. You're going to have to get out to close to 90 Mbps. So again, this whole thing goes back. Where are we going to get the money Mbps. I yeah. thought it was 400 Mbps with 5 5 with Well, 5G. you know, 400 Mbps in a lab, in a lab situation, when you're actually out there in the actual situation, if you, can, if you can get your 90 to 100 Mbps, I mean, you, you, you consider lucky, all right? But there are challenges. Your per megabyte of realization is just 1.16 paisa in India. 
Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, today, you know, the average, uh, you know, you can buy a gigabit of uh, data for uh, 10 bucks, right? 10 rupees. And yeah, the cost to produce it is uh, probably a couple of uh, rupees, uh, you know, worth. So yes, the question is, uh, scope and scale is one of the network elements that allows you to price on this basis, right? 1.1 billion connections all over the, uh, t you know, India. So I think that is critical, but I think you, Ultimately, what you're saying is that you're going to run into problems in terms of the amount of money left in the operator's hands to invest in upgrading network quality. Today, probably because of the lines of business that Reliance Geo is in, they're the, the only, only one. Is probably, yeah, that's that's the, the only one that's probably one which yeah. can, and could Airtel do it? I think Vodafone idea is kind of going through the throes of merger. I mean, you'll have, you'll, have, you'll have built part of it or a lot of the infrastructure for... Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, yeah. Uh, definitely, Geo is rolling out fast and it's even taken on the, uh, uh, the RCOM, right? The RCOM assets and stuff. Sure. So, there is a lot. And in fact, they're also looking at competing directly with BharatNet and sure. getting out uh, right into the villages. So, no doubt about it that, you know, the Geo Giga Fiber is very uh, assertive, very confident in their moves and they are promising to put out 5G far faster. So, of course, we, we are yet to see that, but clearly the move is there, and so is Airtel investing, but probably not at the same pace. I think the, the where we also see, uh, I mean, uh, I, the, you know, there was this discussion around LMO and sure. that, right? So, I feel that uh, while fiber is going to get laid, uh, We've got to figure out a way to ensure that the infrastructure is, is, a, is a level playing field. Because, you know, this becomes an essential infrastructure. After all, I mean, everyone is connected and what have you, but there's got to be regula regulations and, uh, uh, let's be careful saying regulations in front of Rajan, because, yeah, <laughs> I know that I, yeah, yeah, no, but there's got to be uh, some kind of consensus on how the infrastructure is protected and secured, so it does not come into any one hand. And I like the idea of if the LMOs can, you know, connect to uh, the Geo network or to the Bharti network, or whichever works, and, and find an ecosystem that is fairly balanced. Because by the end of the day, the more adaption that takes place, uh, it becomes an issue. And this is where I feel policy needs to concentrate more. So um, my... But is there any move in that direction? So, I, I mean, you know, uh, and, and... I, I mean, there I have been committees wanted... set up, there have been... Exactly, so both of us are part of the uh, 5G Council yep. uh, committee, uh, uh, and, and there are regulations that are moving in certain directions, but I feel that um, th there's so many issues, right? Each one of the industries, I mean, both, uh, if, you, if you take the broadcasters, if you take us, we are so stuck with... Uh, issues and regulatory issues of the today that we're not seeing what's coming in the future. I think there is scope to ensure that there is uh, an, an, a balanced ecosystem perspective that comes in and leverage TREI to drive these views because the NDCP, that is a National Digital Communications Policy, this is for uh, uh, everyone here, has, is, is reasonably balanced in this. They, they want conversions, right? So they want the industry and the ecosystem to work. But in, in reality, Market forces are taking on, there is disruptions that are taking place, but we've got to find a way where policy stops uh, this disruption, to disrupt in a way that the positives of today can become the negatives of tomorrow. I'd like to actually share that British Telecom yeah. and open reach. Uh, so British Telecom, let us say, would be like one of our TSPs, and, uh, and open reach was, uh, you know, uh, their sister concern in infrastructure. There was a very, very big issue that took place where other TSPs felt that the fiber network of open reach, I don't know if you're aware, you know about this, right? So the fi fiber network of open reach, right? So the other TSPs were uh, told to ride on this network. And somewhere down the line, slowly they started to see there was this pull towards the customers of British Telecom only, and the other TSPs did not gain that advantage. And We've got to be, in that sense, we've got to be careful. See, right now we're all very happy. Uh, my company is the happiest. Everyone is investing in fiber, so it's all good. But somewhere down the line, the, the, the uh, you know, thought that the ecosystem finally needs to be sustainable has to come in play, and that's where policy plays a role. 
Let's not look at the near-term issues. We've got to be look at the long-term. The long-term first is the auction. Because uh, first we the... won't have. See, a geo came and overnight there was disruption. Maybe in the railways, maybe in the you know that's Google. Sorry, but you know in in other places, if the policy understands it. The industry is not pushing it as much. And I feel like, you know, someone like you should actually take up something like this. And sure, we will in the future with, with, the, with, with the telecom industry support. We could move in that direction. So coming back again, uh, the 490 to crore that you mentioned per megahertz. I mean, as, as against Korea's 131 crore per megahertz. I mean, I, I, what logic is there? Please explain to me. I know you've mentioned it. But go over it again. I mean, will that, will that really come to realistic levels if it doesn't? We, will we have the 5G at all? Yeah, very clearly, globally, you know, given the fact that the global ecosystem is moving to the gigabit area, 26, 33 gigabits uh, range, right? So what's going to happen, the equipment that is going to be manufactured globally, both the handset side and the network side, is going to be in that range. Yeah. So if we don't conform to those, uh, you know, spectrum bands, then we will never be able to have the networks in place. Sure. So therefore, we, what we talked about yesterday, the present pricing is simply not going to work because you're looking at 500 to 600 megahertz of spectrum per operator when you move into the higher bands. So clearly, the uh, government is aware of it, TRI is aware of it, uh, there's a five high-level 5G uh, committee that was put in place by the DOT, and they've got as one of the deliverables looking at the whole issue of the pricing of spectrum when we move into a high bandwidth required 5G environment. And so I think we'll wait to see uh, what emerges in terms of the pricing. Everybody is aware that you can't have the... But then auctions are expected mid somewhere, mid next year? Um, so there's some debate as to, you know, when. So the industry says, look, it's up to the government to decide when it wants to put up the auction. Yeah. yeah, and uh, they'll put up all of the spectrum so that there's no sort of squeeze on the supply side. And operators will go into the market and decide what they want to buy. And but they didn't buy much the previous year. They did not because, one, they were, you know, there was a debt overhang, and secondly, the pricing was way out of line. So they just picked up what they needed, yeah. right? Going forward, I think you're going to see the same thing. They're just going to pick up incremental mental pieces of spectrum in the 2300 band, which is kind of where 4G is required. Yeah. And so you'll see that. But uh, I think most operators will wait for a while to see, you know, what are the use cases that are going to emerge for 5G, because that's the basis on which you calculate your revenue stream, which then allows you to say, okay, now I'm willing to bid X for the spectrum. So without having a clear understanding of the revenue stream that is going to yeah. apply, it's just a roll of the dice in terms of what you want to bid for the auction. Yeah, in the meanwhile, the government will put in some loose change for trials. That, that's what's happening in the, in the, in the meanwhile. So you're, you're, you know, you've been recommending that 2020, we should wait for the first, by 2020 is the date you've been recommending for the auctions rather than 2019. Yeah, so what we're suggesting is that, yes, uh, you know, end of next year or whatever, whenever the government feels that it is necessary. And the industry is saying is that, let's, you, know, you can get to do a regular auction process, all right, and uh, operators as and when they need it, uh, will go into the market and will buy what they need. And I think it's good because what you want is predictability in terms of the supply of spectrum and in terms of a process which is transparent, fair, and, uh, you know, it doesn't uh, it, it sort of involve an inordinate price for the spectrum. As long as those parameters in place, uh, the, the periodicity of the spectrum's uh, auctions is not of a major concern, as, as I said, as long as we know the yeah. timeframes and the way forward. The point I want to make in terms of this audience is to ask ourselves the question, listen, at the end of the day, all of us now, as in a converged environment, are really, really looking at two things, content and distribution, right? And let's just, just look at the distribution side. On the distribution side, the cost per delivery of bit is going to determine who's going to be left and uh, who's going to be standing at the end of the day. So I don't care where, whether you're cable, where you're free over the air, whether you're satellite, whatever, at the end of the day, in order to be able to deliver X number of buys to the end consumer, right, and all data network, right, that's going to be predictive in terms of what's going to dominate. Now, obviously, then you move back and saying is that those who can provide the network or the delivery mechanism at the lowest unit cost are going to be those who are going to be successful. So you've got to be able to look at that whole configuration and say, how do I do it? All right, because if customer experience, as everybody says, is key, 
then you have to be able to find out what's happening when the customer is using it predominantly on a handset. Sure. All right, or in his own whatever, right? So that is going to be, and you have to be predictive in terms of saying, you can't wait for you know, a, a failure to happen. So this is where artificial intelligence is going to have to become a key ingredient into the planning process because that's what all, at least on the TSP side, operators are looking at. But not in the cable side. There's no AI, there's no ML, there's maybe on the OTT side some of that is happening. Well, I'm saying is that, again, when you look at customer experience, and if you're telling me in terms of video consumption yep. and uh, if the consumer is going to be able to determine what who uh, he or she is going to select from, then you have to be able to know real time Absolutely. and on a predictive basis what that experience is going to look like. And again, when you look at the content side, listen, anybody can do a deal. Right? Apple showed us, right? Just Steve Jobs showed us on the music side. Hey, listen, I had to pay, you know, uh, eight to ten bucks for a CD with, uh, you know, five songs that I really wanted and ten songs, nine, ten songs I didn't want, right? Yeah. And then I went to a unit price of 99 cents, yeah. done, finished, right? And he was able to convince uh, all of the artists to be able to, you know, done, and I say the rest is history. So I think we've got to look at these types of issues uh, in terms of what could happen on the content side and say, Look, if somebody offers you the best deal in terms of content delivery and that gets folded into the price of uh, content, it will, uh, there's always that backward push. And there's also Spotify, which is a very good case in point, which is giving back more to the music industry than any of the uh, online, uh, like YouTube is giving, which is what is causing a furor again. I don't know if you know the Spotify case. Oh, yeah, you know, our children use it a lot. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, we could go on and on forever, but... Uh, I'd like to say something. Yeah, please go ahead. I, I, I feel, you know, so you're right. I mean, content is important, but I still emphasize that content with infrastructure is, is a brilliant package to sell. If we don't, if we keep infrastructure out of the mix uh, in, in marketing, somewhere down the line, uh, you know, the customer would not feel uh, very comfortable. They're just going on a brand name that, that, is, that is familiar or known. But when you bring this out, where your infrastructure is so reliable, and I want to push Rajan to say SLAs should be there on the TSP. Yeah. Oh, so, on but the TS SLAs on the TSP is okay. Yeah, but at the end of the day, right, the customer experience, the customer doesn't care. I mean, is it my router that isn't working? Is it the cell tower, the outside that's not working? Is it your cable that's uh, not working? You know, at the end of the day, you know, he or she will want one neck to catch right, when there's a problem in terms of the delivery you know, of the content, right? So yes, content will play, but the consumer at the end of the day just does, is not, does not want to have this whole thing disaggregated and say, look, if you have a problem with your quote unquote network, however the delivery, may go catch XYZ or a multiplicity of XYZs, and then oh, on the content side, it does, just doesn't work this way. It's a bundled offer that you're making. No, but who's responsible for the experience then? Who's responsible? Tell me, who yeah, takes so, the responsibility? You have, it's better that we have one pipe. Uh, I think Nicholas Negoprande had stated, if I go back in time, the digital, in the digital book where he stated that there'll be one pipe, it's going to become ubiquitous, delivering everything to you, which is where the internet yeah, of things you know, is coming in. Yeah, Anil, this is a this, There's accountability to one person. Correct. So let me just tell you, right? I mean, just a, a couple of days ago, I, we had, had a session where it became very evident that 30% of the problems is in your handset. It is on the quality of your handset, it's not on the quality of the network. How will the customer know this? Because the customer only knows about the network. So I rest my case. I'm saying that by the end of the day, as far as the customer is concerned, the customer is connected either to a TSP or an LMO or uh, the distributor, right? And, and the customer uh, would, uh, holds that person responsible. Yeah, you but know, I'm saying is that when the customer makes a choice, hang on, hang on, hang yeah. B2B uh, or the, the, the partner discussions that are happening at the back end, there's got to be a push on, on infrastructure reliability as, as, as a very strong negotiating point. Uh, sure, because you, I, you are facing the ire of the customer anyway. Right. But I'm saying is that I can have the best network quality in the world and if you have a lousy device in your hand, sorry, it won't, you know, it won't work. That is the today. That is now we have realized. And as we realize, you know, information is, is coming out in the open. But the fact remains is that um, when, when the customer understood about infrastructure, till, till the understanding exists, the customer is going to ask for it. Yeah. So there's no question. Yeah. I think there is scope. There has to be balance between both the device as well as the infrastructure. That's the thing is that, yeah. So as I said, at the end of the day, the customer is going to have, that's why we look from the TSP side, 
is uh, you know quality of the experience. You know, customer experience is everything now. So yeah, we you know, are talking about TSPs. I see somebody being uh, IoT. I, I don't know how I'm going to call it an IoT SP. We're delivering everything. Forget not just one service. It's everything. You know, telecom, my mobile telephony, my video, my controlling my environment. So are we ready for that environment? Yeah, going I think forward in, in as 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 a communications policy, do we have all those things coming in place? Not yet, right? We are yeah. still dealing with components. Yeah, so we're let's dealing with cable, think, we are dealing with broadcasting. Yeah, so just look at it. I'm saying is that yeah, I mean if you're looking at uh, you know, content delivered through some restricted medium. But just look at our world in terms of saying is that, look, it's either IP, you know, coming over the internet or comes over through a router. I'm saying is that, yes, most operators will take end-to-end -end responsibility, right? And then say is that, yes, if I'm monitoring you and I find that it's your handset that's calling, causing the problem, I'll probably give you a call and say, you better get your handset checked because, you know, you've got a dual SIM phone and you've just inserted the wrong SIM in the wrong slot. And that's why you're now facing a slowage in the terms of speeds. We've noticed this, we saw it, and we've brought this up. So those are the types of issues we're saying is that but customer experience. a larger picture going yeah. forward, larger so, picture. So I think the policy is very well drafted uh, okay. in principle policy. But then why are we dealing with components? That's what I'm stating now. What's that? What's why that? are we dealing with components? Why can't we... I'm, I'm, I'm being, I know I'm being an idealist. Like, yeah, I'm no, being so an idealist. See, see, I'll tell you what. So before there was a larger ministry, now it is the Ministry of Telecom yeah. and the Ministry of IT, and there are all these pieces there. But I think the national digital communications Absolutely. policy, the very fact that they are saying digital versus national telecom policy to start with, and, and they, they, they are, they've got stated goals with timelines. Sure. How we They're being missed. All, most of them are being missed. No, 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 no. no. But, but when you're saying 50% fixed line access by 2022, Right, you're saying uh, 50 Mbps minimum coverage, right? So that these people are putting these goals. The fact remains is that, and I'm not disputing that these are aggressive and I'm not disputing that they have missed, let's say, Bharat Net goals. Yeah. But at the same time, the government is, we, we can safely say is, is, is probably bad with, the, with forecasting the timelines, but they are definitely working very aggressively to reach uh, uh, certain- Close to those. Yeah, certain milestones because Somewhere down the line, you know, I think there is a shift towards accountability in certain areas, which has come into play. So I'll tell you what. So there is a push towards ease of business. Rajan fights about it every day, almost, and uh, we are pushing very hard from our industry because, by you know, everyone recognizes the importance of fiber. I mean, forget components; they just recognize the, recognize the importance of fiber only because of of the reliability and access, right? But the reason why fiber never got laid in India is ease of business hurdles. Sure. And, and that, th this is something that the ministries, which is not only our line ministry of Department of Telecom or IT, there, are, there is Commerce, there is Niti Aayog, everyone is talking, is at least moving towards talking this language. I am optimistic that the NDCP will reach a part of its conclusion, much more than the NTP of 2012, which okay. did not reach anywhere. Yeah. So I feel that this is better drafted and there, there, there seems to be, they're putting systems in place, creating committees and everything, but they're putting systems in place to reach there. To, uh, and there is convergence in this, which was not the case earlier. Yeah. There, was a, there was an aspect of convergence, aspect. but not, yeah. This is a very high level document and sure. it needs to get implemented. So it's, it's gonna take a while. But, but what I'm saying is that I feel the government is moving in the right direction, but your everyday hurdles and issues still continues to be a challenge within a system that is archaic in its, the way it is structured. So you have IS officers who want to drive their viewpoints, but they're stuck by the way the whole system is, you know, silosed and, you know, placed. What, what I'm trying to say is I feel we are going to see chaos for a while, but it's going to only move towards the better. So you have similar problems compared to what the cable sector has currently? Yes. Similar. I, yeah, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll cut it short. I know I was saying cut it, cut it. We're just keeping on saying. Oh. So we, yeah, we could go on. Thank you very much. I don't know whether it's been... I just want to add because I was just yeah. thinking about this. So there's a lot of discussion around food and uh, everything from a la carte to buffets to those as So I just wanted to say, uh, and uh, uh, you know, to the TSPs uh, too, that fiber and food and in the network both are equally important. So instead of spectrum, start looking at fiber also. Yeah, that could be a solution for you too. So, you know, a mobile network 
it always needs spectrum, right? Fiber will be a mix, right? The last mile, yeah. last mile, right? It's a customer preference. It's not a, it's not a choice that we make, right? I'm saying is that the customer, even in your own home, doesn't want to be tethered. I'm saying offset, no? Get more fiber in. I'm sorry? Uh, she's saying offset, get more fiber in. Yeah, but I'm saying is that uh, it'll never get the requirement when I'm pumping in nine gigahertz and the access, the last mile is mobile, right? You'll need spectrum. You can't, uh, you know, you can't, uh, you know. I'm saying replace, I'm saying bring in more fiber. Yeah, that, that we agree, that we agree. So we're saying that as far as to the edge that you can bring fiber. I mean, what right now what we're trying to do is bring fiber to our cell towers. Only 20% of our cell towers today are fiberized. We've got to go to the other 80% so because we know that yes, with the data loads that are there, you will ultimately need fiber to back on. Yeah, Actually, so right, yeah. The target is 1.5 million to 2.5 million, right? That's the target for backhaul. Anyway, I'll, I'll cut it short. We can go on forever. Thank you very much. I think I, I enjoyed this conversation. I hope you all did. Or if it's deja vu for I apologize. Thank you. <laughs>